Shalom. I teach free diving here in Elat in Israel. Uh, I'm an Ada instructor trainer, and we do courses of all uh, of all ranks, and we also train people who want to do uh, <coughs> competitions. Uh, please, apart from asking questions. Uh, because that's what this is all about. It's supposed to be some kind of a dialogue. If I don't get the questions, you're going to get an awful lot of silence. So please, anything you like. If you don't want your name mentioned, please say, don't mention my name. And uh, I won't do so. Uh, also, uh, just a quick check. We've been having some technical difficulties with the webinar. And... Uh, Please, uh, if, you, if you don't hear me for any reason, uh, or see me, well, that's less important, um, please just send us immediately a note. We already have a feedback that it works, working good. Okay, we already have a feedback that it's working well. Thank you very much, whoever did that. Um, we have a question already uh, this evening in front of us. It's from Fernando. Fernando has been experimenting with a nose clip and has been playing on Return to the Surface a bullfrog. Uh, everybody, or at least 90% of the people that I know who uh, use a nose clip for the first time have exactly this problem that they come up burping air. Uh, he says that his friends suffer from it uh, the day after as well. Um, okay, this is, that's fairly extreme. It's really caused by the same thing. The good news is it corrects itself with time. And it doesn't take much time. Probably between the time that he actually wrote the question and me answering it, he may have solved the problem for himself. What happens? When you have a mask on and you equalize your ears, uh, the moment you let go with your hand, a small amount of air is released into the mask. Uh, this is only helpful because it helps to compensate for the mask uh, compressing on your face and uh, it relieves the pressure in the sinuses and uh, it's only beneficial. Um, however, you've got a nose clip on now, you haven't got a mask on. Uh, by the way, if anybody imagined that they could put a nose clip over the mask, don't try it. It turns the mask into goggles and it has very bad effects on the eyes. Um, let me get back to this. If you've, got a, if you've got a nose clip on, what happens is very simple. That air that you equalize with, there's no spillage suddenly. So, what happens? You tend to swallow the air at first. And then it has the inevitable results when you come to the surface. I think this answers the question, when does it happen? He asked me, when does it happen on the descent or the ascent? The answer is, it happens basically on the descent when you're trying to equalize. Uh, one of the things that can uh, also help the air swallowing because another stage at which it does you do tend to swallow air is when you're coming back because suddenly you find if you've got a nose clip on a lot of pressure building uh, in the sinuses and behind your nose uh, my advice to you is when that happens remove the nose clip if there's pressure there you're not going to get water suddenly flooding your nose this won't happen. Uh, you have to be a little bit sensitive as to when you do this. If you're down on a very deep dive, you don't want to remove the nose clip on the bottom. Because then there's a possibility that you haven't got enough air to oppose the entry of water and you could partially flood uh, at least your nasal cavities. So my advice is wait 
And during the ascent, when you feel pressure kind of building up and you feel that it's becoming un uncomfortable, uh, then uh, you have no problem at all. Just remove the nose clip and uh, go up normally. Uh, it has an additional advantage moving the, removing the nose clip underwater. And that is when you get to the surface, there's one less thing to worry about when you're doing your surface protocol. While we're on the subject, one other little tip. Wherever possible, if you're practicing for the first time diving without a mask, don't go immediately to the goggles, uh, liquid goggles. Liquid goggles have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantages is uh, depth perception. I don't know how many people have come up, missed the line in trying to grab the line when they came up to the surface, and then the face goes under the water and they get a red card because they've come out of the water once and they've dipped again. Uh, it also happens that it's another thing to remember for the surface protocol. And a lot of people have got red cards because they forgot to remove the goggles. Uh, when you come up into the air, uh, unless you see underneath the goggles, you can't see anything through those lenses at all. Um, underwater they tend to distort, as I say, your distance judgment. So even grabbing a tag can be a challenge at first. If you can possibly get used to it, it's a minor degree of discomfort at first, but very soon it becomes absolutely second nature. Um, just dive without goggles. Uh, even at depth, even in pitch dark, uh, looking for, I have no trouble looking for uh, luminous tags at the bottom. Uh, with a little bit of common sense, and if you're not too knocked, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a huge challenge. And you very, very soon get used to the idea of water on the eyes. Uh, usually it doesn't sting after a while, I mean very quickly, it stops stinging. Um, now whenever I go in and I take off my mask, I don't feel any stinging sensation on the eyes whatsoever. Uh, even if I haven't uh, used a nose clip for some time. Uh, when one's teaching, one tends not to use a nose clip. Um, and then suddenly coming back to it, you don't have a problem. Uh, saline, water is saline and uh, it's compatible with the eye. Uh, you're not going to get eye infections unless you're dealing with very polluted water. Uh, the one time I don't, I feel a great deal of discomfort using it, and I wouldn't recommend it, being bare-eyed is in a swimming pool. Chlorine is not a great friend to your eyes. Uh, and that can sting badly. So, but if you're in the sea, uh, I'd persevere with it a little bit. It has a lot of advantages. Somebody just asked me, what about a small nose clip under the mask? Ah. Well, if you could find such a thing, and if you had such a configuration, there are small nose clips which are used for synchronized swimming and things like that. So I think I know what he means. What have you done? When you permanently closed your mask, when your nose, how do you equalize your mask? Here's one example of that. There are others. Um, you could possibly wear this under a mask, but then you'd have a problem. How do you equalize the mask? And if you don't equalize the mask, you're going to get a very, very nasty eye squeeze in the best circumstances. In worse circumstances, you could be damaging your eye. So no, that's not a good idea at all. I don't recommend that. In fact, I heartily recommend that you don't even try anything like that. Okay, um, I'm just going to do a brief check to see if we've got more questions coming in. Uh, 
question? Okay. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to talk about tonight is a subject that uh, bothers a lot of people over the winter. We're going to talk in general terms about winter training and physical preparation for summer diving. I did talk about uh, our version of the breath walk last week. I did talk about certain things that you can learn from the breath walk if you've got a heart monitor. You can learn about your percentage of tachycardia to bradycardia. Let me explain. Uh, when you first hold your breath, the pulse rate tends to go up. And after a certain point, it then starts to go down. That's bradycardia. Tachycardia going up, bradycardia going down. Now, the question is, when you impose a time limit on this, that you're doing, I don't know, a minute and 20 seconds static uh, before, you go, before you get up and walk, still holding your breath, uh, you may find that you have 10 seconds of tachycardia and the rest of bradycardia. If you do, you're very lucky because then you're going to be starting your walk already with quite a low pulse rate. On the other hand, it could be exactly the reverse, that you have a very long tachycardia phase and a short bradycardia phase so that the pulse rate has not dropped that much from when you took it at the end of the ventilation period. Uh, so it tells you all about your particular patterns in that. Uh, why are these interesting? Because they can also give you a clue to how much warm-up you need. Your percentage of tachycardia, bradycardia. Now, um, but there's uh, quite a science in, in that particular one on learning how to read that. And learning how to read its changes between uh, repetitions during the same exercise period. The other thing is when you're walking, what people are very astonished to find is that when you're walking and holding your breath, the pulse rate doesn't usually go up. In a highly trained freediver, it'll actually go down from the end of your static period during the time that you're walking. That's a bit extraordinary because if I'm just sitting here breathing and quietly doing nothing, I have a low pulse rate. The moment I get up and walk, the pulse rate goes up. Well, if you're holding your breath, it doesn't go up. What's, what's preventing this? Your breath hold reflex. Now, the funny thing is that the dramatic drop in the pulse rate towards the end of a pushed breath walk only usually occurs for the first time in the first 10 or maximum 15 seconds of the walk. Think about that. What's happened here? The heart yeah, has suddenly decided, ooh, there's an emergency, I better do something slow down to conserve oxygen and this is what happens you can train that to happen earlier and earlier but it's a very interesting phenomenon it's interesting measuring when that actually happens for me um, apart from that let's go on to other things it's a very quick back glance at uh, one very very valuable exercise for increasing your breath hold and learning a lot of information about yourself, that's the breath walk. Let's move forward. In the 1990s, at the beginning of the 1990s, um, when uh, Umberto Perizzari was uh, the big name together with uh, Pippin. Uh, in, in, comp in competition in competitions and they exchange records uh, uh, on half yearly basis between them butting heads um, 
a something like I think two to three Italian universities began to take an interest again opening the door in free dive physiology that hadn't been looked at since really the early 1960s and a lot of questions were asked and a lot of different answers emerged one of the things that was bothering people because the universities were helping uh, Umberto train and devise uh, training programs was what is freediving? Is it an aerobic event, an anaerobic event and is it wholly anaerobic or is it a mixture of the two? Um, there have been sort of leftovers from this particular question Truth of the matter is, doesn't really matter because we know today what kind of training is the most suitable for freedive and we will go on refining that but at least we have a basic answer to this. The basic answer is, basically freediving is an anaerobic event the deeper we go, the more important it is to do two or three things. One, train CO2 tolerance. Two, train lactic acid tolerance. In the process, a lot of things that we thought would only happen with long periods of aerobic exercise do actually change. Uh, there's a frequent misunderstanding, I'm going to get fit for freediving. So immediately a person starts running five kilometers a day minimum and they get on their bike and they start pedaling for 10 or 15 kilometers and uh, after a period of time uh, they try out the results of all their efforts in the water and they find, hey, nothing has moved. What has happened here? Think about the event that you're doing. When you're pedaling your bike or when you're doing a long, slow run, your body is getting sufficient exercise the whole time. That's the meaning of aerobic exercise. Does that happen when you're free diving? No, it doesn't happen. So fundamentally, whether the beginning part of the free dive might be aerobic is really irrelevant. It is, in its essence, an anaerobic exercise. Uh, so all this thing of, we need to train cardio. What the hell is cardio? We have to be specific here. Aerobic or anaerobic? Now, unless you're extremely unfit and not ready, the body cannot yet tolerate anaerobic training, uh, then you should move straight away into anaerobic training. Everything else is going to follow. If you are really a couch potato and you're overweight and uh, you're not 18 anymore, I'm not 18 anymore, believe it or not, um, then you might need a period doing cardio just to allow your body, it's not specifically for free diving. It's to get you to the point when your body can actually support anaerobic training. Now here's the thing. 90% of the competitive divers that I deal with and who come to me have been overtraining horribly. And if you overtrain, you're not doing yourself any favors at all. Uh, free diving, unlike swimming, is a very intense, uh, short period event. And uh, long training sessions are not profitable. Uh, anaerobic training you can get don't forget the more you stress the body the more body needs rest rest is part of your training 
It's not something that just allows you to recover. It is part of your training. When you stress the body, it doesn't adapt. When you rest, the body gets a message and begins to adapt. Uh, we see this very clearly from weightlifters. They will lift heavy weight and they will produce micro tears in the muscle. Now, the muscle doesn't grow or get stronger during the training. It gets, tra it gets stronger when it repairs itself during the rest period, which is up to about 72 hours after training. Now, a lot of the thing is, the, in, when we're talking about anaerobic training and lactic training, particularly dry for free diving, uh, we have to respect this idea and factor into our training rest. So beginning with that, I'm going to describe one of the best exercises that you can possibly do for getting real fitness for free diving, not just general cardio. You want general cardio, go and join an, an, an aerobics class in, in the gym, yeah? Um, this which is, is not, not for free diving. Which is not bad for somebody who doesn't do anything. It's not bad for something for somebody who doesn't do anything. But this is not training for free diving. Let's be specific. Now, uh, free uh, training for free diving is short, highly intense, and you have to be very, very careful how you do it. Uh, one of the best ways to start is by doing interval training. That means to say short sprints and short rest periods between the sprints. This is only to prepare your body for something that is the real training. The real training is what we call heel repeats. Um, they are a form of self-torture. Uh, there are a certain degree of masochists, they're all competitive freedivers, who uh, get to love these things because they produce such incredible results very quickly. The other advantage is you do not do them more than twice a week. And you don't have to worry about anything else to do with cardio. You'll get all the cardio you want from this. You choose a steep hill. <laughs> I will try to. Okay? We've got a steep hill. And what you do is this. That before you get to the hill, you do about 12 minutes slow running, jogging on a flat surface. Then you get to your hill. And now begins the hill repeats. You sprint up the hill as fast as you can go for 20 seconds, not more, 20 seconds, and then you walk down the hill again. When you got to the bottom, the moment you get to the bottom without resting, you sprint up the hill again, flat out, and you try to go further each time. Now you do that for the first week four times. Don't forget you're training twice a week. And I really mean sprint up. If you've got to find yourself the ugliest yeah, trainer that you can possibly have with a large switch who's going to follow you and smack you on the bottom to get you to move faster up the hill, then pay him to do it. Seriously, it really helps to have a friend encouraging you, yelling at you, yeah? making sure that there's not one atom in your body that is becoming lazy, that you're giving it everything you've got, and that shouts at you the moment the 20 seconds are up. Very often people doing this exercise, it's so intense, don't hear an alarm on a watch. Uh, and they're also, uh, you're not going to be looking at a watch. Forget that. If you can look at a watch, you're not doing the exercise properly. 
So it's much better to have a friend who's doing the timing for you, calling out, letting you know when the, um, when the 20 seconds are up. And, uh, and four repeats for the first week, second week five, third week six, fourth week seven repeats. Fast as you can up the hill. Now, don't forget, each time you're, you're trying to go a bit further. So that covers a month of training. The second month of training, you do something very strange. You don't increase the time of the run. You cut it in half. By cutting it in half, you are also, but don't forget, you're walking down. The moment you hit the bottom, you're going back up again. You're also cutting the interval down between the repeats. The, so in other words, you're running for 10 seconds in the second month, flat out, and you can go faster. You'll find that you go faster. And on top of that, feel that there's a tiger behind you, biting your calves, and you blast it up the hill, and you're going to have a very short walk before you have to do it again. So again, twice a week, not more. Not more is better. Uh, more is not better in this case, it's worse. So only twice a week. Don't do it two days running. So going back to the second month, first time, again, four repeats for the first week. Second week, five repeats. Third week, six repeats, and the fourth week, seven repeats. Then you're ready. You're in condition. And then the only thing you have to do is occasional holding exercises. Uh, I would time this in such a way that this is peaking close to the time uh, that you want to do your best during the summer. Uh, so this is a very, very, uh, an incredibly powerful exercise, one of the best. It was given to me by uh, uh, an Olympic coach and also he coached uh, very high level uh, rugby players. Uh, I've used it for training freedivers and it's had superb results. And that's all the cardio you need. If you think the other days you have to get on your bicycle and do 20 kilometers or 30 or 40 or 50 kilometers, you're not doing yourself a favor. Remember, long, slow exercise is not what we're after. You're getting all the oxygen you need and you're spoiling your body. You're getting the body used to the fact that whenever it exercises, it's going to get enough ex it's going to get enough oxygen. That doesn't happen. Now, the one thing that happens, this exercise of hill repeats, is two things. It's both a lactic acid exercise and a highly anaerobic exercise. So it produces a lot of lactic acid. So we have to get rid of that. Don't forget, again, a slow at least 12 minute run down on the flat after it. Slow jogging on the flat for about, uh, about 12 to 15 minutes. Then you want to do a stretching session for at least another 30 minutes. If you don't do this, you're going to get your muscles seizing up. Uh, you're going to start get developing cramps and you're going to get muscle shortening. Uh, an awful lot of free divers that I've seen that are particularly um, who are coming to us for high level competition have done their version of uh, getting fit for free diving before it. Two things that we notice, they've been doing the wrong exercise which hasn't done much for 
uh, their tolerance to lactic acid. And the next thing that we notice is that they're as stiff as planks. In the water, you have to become water, my friend. You have to be fluid. You have to be very, very flexible. You have to have a good amplitude in your movements. In order to be streamlined, you need flexibility. In order to do particularly monofinning movement, most men are like planks. And when you see them, they do a sort of bowing motion that makes them look like a Japanese waiter. Uh, we call that the Japanese waiter syndrome. Uh, and their body is moving in all the wrong directions. So, and this is usually a result of not stretching sufficiently after an exercise. One of the uh, best exercises that we have uh, for stretching, specifically for uh, monofinners and free dive, free dive monofinners, is uh, the little 10 inch ball. Now, this is an absolute gem. This should uh, be a toy that everybody has. They're highly, highly affordable. And uh, they're very, very, it's a very, very simple exercise that doesn't demand much except two things. Thought, that means concentration on what you're doing, that the mind doesn't wander off and then into dreamland. Yeah, but you actually think every second about what you're doing and persistence in the, same, in the fact that you have to do it every day. You lie down and the ball goes immediately behind the middle of the back. Can you hold the ball for me? Yeah. And this will be in about, uh, which way do I move? About there at first. Yeah, just about level with the shoulder blades. Then what you do is centimeter by centimeter practically, you roll the ball down. This is lying on your back, lying on the ball, and you're in a kind of cruciform position. Your arms out to the side. Unfortunately, we can't organize the uh, computers so that you can see it on the floor. So the ball, yeah, may begin here at the shoulder height and then slowly, still carrying on stretching, you'll move it down until roughly if you put a spike through the base of your sternum where you have that little flexible tip where the ribs come up and join, it's called the zypoid process. If you put a, a spike through the zypoid process to your back, that's where the center of the ball would end up. And we stretch several minutes every day doing that because particularly men, you may have developed through yoga or through other exercises a certain degree of flexibility in the lower back. Very few men have flexibility in the upper spine, which is what we need very badly for monofinning. Okay, let me be clear about this. This is done in a lying position, lying on your back, on a yoga mat, on the floor, with the ball underneath, uh, roughly the center of the ball going in a line between your shoulder blades. That's where we begin, and the head hangs over the back of the ball, and you try to touch the, the floor with the, back of your, with the top of your head. Uh, a very simple exercise. And what is very important in this exercise is how you breathe. You begin to breathe into the abdomen and let the air come up into the chest. And that opens the whole of the front intercostals here. And it really opens the whole of the thorax. This is a very, very important exercise because this gives you uh, something that there's only one other thing that uh, does it and we don't particularly like recommending it and that's dry packing. 
Uh, it's become a popular exercise. We certainly don't recommend it. There are other ways of getting there. They're equally good and without the dangers of dry packing. Too many people have had uh, very severe lung incidences by packing. And then stretching yeah, on a packed lung. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, I'm repeating a little bit of where I came to last week. Um, champions have been doing this for some time, particularly pool champions, and uh, have had good results with, uh, with it without uh, problems, simply because they have increased the number of packs very, very slowly and very carefully. And they've taught themselves correct stretching techniques. All these uh, are important before you begin anything like that. But to avoid all those problems, the little ball is a great help. The next part of the little ball is lying on your front and breathing arms out to the side again and breathing with the chest the ball uh, the end of the ball coming right above the base of the sternum here and here again what happens is you'll find that it's very uncomfortable you can't breathe in the front now what do I do you'll learn to breathe into the back intercostals uh, there are yoga exercises for this um, however, this, some of those, it'll take you quite some time before they're accessible to you. This should be accessible to nearly anybody at any stage of stiffness. And believe me, it will have very profound results if you persist with the exercise. So, although I've connected uh, stretching of all kinds, of obviously after hill repeats, uh, some of the uh, main things to stretch are the lower part of the body and there are specific stretches for this. A lot of the runner's stretches are adequate. You don't have to become uh, a um, third stage yogi in order, to, uh, in order to manage that. If you look up what the runner's stretches are and you really do them consciously this is another thing that I must bring into the, uh, the discussion. Um, the mind is an incredibly important part of the training. I see people who are doing repetitions either in a gym or running or anything else. They're on automatic pilot. They're thinking of God knows what and their mind is all over the place particularly when you're stretching, first of all, you should enjoy it. Uh, the masters of stretching are the household cat. They're geniuses at it. And it's very plain that they enjoy it. So try and stretch with a smile on your face. Uh, cats are brilliantly flexible creatures incredibly powerful jumpers. Uh, our little athlete is, uh, would make any uh, Olympic high jumper look like a complete pedestrian. Uh, and a lot of it is the flexibility and the length of their muscles and the elasticity of their muscles. An elastic muscle is a strong muscle. Um, all this, uh, here we, we fight beliefs from God knows when. Uh, there were sort of all sorts of things that were going around in the bodybuilding world and everything else. That flexibility and strength are enemies one of the other. Well, for anybody who still believes any of this crap, I'll give you a little piece of advice and say, go and watch an Olympic gymnast. 
on one hand. They are incredibly strong and very flexible. Go and watch an awful lot of bodybuilders who look like a Robocop who can't move. And if you put them in the water, they look disastrous. They look like, help, rescue me, quick. Um, so here's the other thing. We recommend uh, in winter training, uh, it's not necessary to, do, to use weights in order to train. We have plenty of other things that using only your body weight, if you need to increase strength, uh, that is a much better way to go. Uh, you'll have to take into account that I'm not an agent um, for any of the things I'm about to recommend. Uh, the TRX system of training, where you've got a nice little uh, band that you fasten in a closed door, series of straps, and they help you use your body weight to train an awful lot of different movements, is an excellent idea. And it can be adapted for specific and non-specific free dive training, and it does a very, very, very fine job. In the old days, for upper body strength, um, we used to use dips for the triceps and for, again, the whole of the upper back, shoulders. Uh, we used to use also pull-ups and chin-ups, hands that way, wide apart that way, yeah, narrow grip that way, yeah, or chin-ups as well. They're all superb exercises if you think you need more upper body strength. Another one that we used, which uh, is not accessible to everybody, um, but even there are some old men around who can still do it, is what's called Chinese press-ups, where you do a handstand against a door, and your hand, you're standing on your hands, and you allow your head to touch the floor, and then you push up into the handstand again. And again, you're only using body weight. That's an extreme one. Uh, however, you can build up to that, again, using your straps, your TRX system. Could we find the, um, in my cupboard, the Terabands? Uh, there's another thing, which are very good things for people who cannot afford a gym, either the time or the money. You can work out the most tremendous amount of exercises using a very simple thing called terabands. I'm going to see if we've got one available. Uh, they are in fact elastic straps. Uh, they're color coded for different uh, coding of um, uh, stiffness, hardness. Uh, we have a purple one here and then harder yet uh, we have the hardest one is the gray one. They're about a meter and a half. They're that wide. Yeah. And there's an amazing amount of exercises that you can do using them. The stretching master came home. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the master of, of stretching. <laughs> yeah. um, now, here's the thing. Uh, Pippin and Audrey years ago used to do a very good exercise um, for uh, um, no limits. Um, it's equally or even more important for people who are doing free immersion. It was rather like the breath walk which is a breath hold exercise. So if we've got our heel repeats for our cardio and if we've got our breath walk, 
we're, we're quite a long way towards it. If we've got a good stretching session uh, thrown in, it's fantastic. But there are people who say, look, um, I want to, to make things a little bit more specific. So we're going to talk about uh, exercises for uh, different, different disciplines. But here's the uh, first one. We get our TerraBand. Can you get me a toilet roll? What? Toilet roll. Um, okay. Now, one of the... Uh, let me go back, let me backtrack a little bit here. Pippin and Audrey had a secret exercise that they did on breath hold, which was done on what's called the Total Gym 1000. I don't know whether you've seen this machine. It was advertised by Chuck Norris on uh, television. A uh, frightening machine. I think he used to beat the hell out of it every week if it didn't, uh, didn't comply with what he want, with what he wanted. But what we do is we get the TerraBand, we put on it on the middle of the TerraBand simply a roll of toilet paper. Okay? Then we put the toilet paper and the TerraBand on the other side of the door, slide under the door just the bands, and then on that side of the door we put down a mat on the floor, lie on our back. Here and do this exercise. And we do this again while holding our breath. Uh, you'll find that that pretty closely duplicates the kind of resistance uh, that you're going to need to apply when you're doing free immersion. Uh, we can make this more and more specific. Uh, it's a very good exercise for that. We can have, in other words, a static period of breath hold before it, like we would for the breath walk, and then start with straight arms uh, doing your, your exercise while still holding your breath. Now, let's say you can hold your breath for another minute or a minute and a half if you're good. If you're better, two minutes. So in other words, you've held your breath for a minute twenty and you've exercised still holding your breath for two minutes. When you can't hold your breath anymore, what you do is you start breathing but you still go on doing this until you can't do that anymore that at that stage becomes a lactic acid exercise and it's again an extremely extremely good and specific one for people who want to work for um, free immersion it exercises the muscles that you want in an anaerobic fashion that's to say an oxygen salves fashion it gets them used to a buildup of lactic acid so you get an inurement to lactic acid while you're doing this, if you follow where I'm going with this. And it's an excellent preparation for people who want to do pre uh, free immersion. Uh, these breath hold exercises, dry breath hold exercises, are adaptable yeah, to every form of... Uh, um, to every form of, of uh, free diving. Uh, for the um, for the breaststroke, I believe it or not, what I call the Cossack jumps are probably the best thing, and you don't have to go very far for them because what what's important here is the number of jumps you do. In other words, what you're doing is uh, you're holding your breath statically, and then you're squatting down on the floor with your legs apart, and you simply jump up and uh, you go on jumping up until you can't hold your breath anymore and again after that keep on doing the jumps until you can't jump anymore 
uh, you only want to do those, if you're doing it with uh, that kind of thing, two repetitions of the exercise are enough at a time. Again, more is not better. Let me go back to what something that I took the trouble to, um, to repeat. When I talked about the breath walk a week ago, and I talked, I had a little revision of it just now, uh, I said that while you were walking with a trained freediver, the breath, the heartbeat would fall. But the heartbeat only drops dramatically for about the last 10% of the walk. So in other words, here's another note to you. If you're doing a breath walk, if you're doing any of the substitutions for it or derivations of it for different disciplines, uh, it's, um, it's not profitable to do a lot of repetitions working at about 70 to 80 percent of your capacity. Because the heart will not get to the point at which it drops. It'll say, hey, I can cope with this. Uh, and the, the heart will only slow down and adapt in a really intense um, repetition where you've done more than 90%, very close to your maximum. Uh, you can't do a lot of maximum repetitions, nor should you try to do a lot of maximum repetitions. So, uh, again, more is not better. Uh, the things that I've been seeing recently were an awful lot of CMAS pool training schedules and for this reason I don't like them very much. Uh, well, I'm just going to check and see if we've got some more questions no. come in. No. We haven't got uh, more questions coming in at the moment. Uh, so, um, just a few other things in planning a, tra a training schedule. See if you've got all your compartments moving together in the right direction. Breath hold training, I can train out of the water. Lactic acid training and CO2 training, I can train out of the water. Uh, other words here. People keep on uh, talking to me about hypoxic table. I don't know anybody really who's doing hypoxic tables today. They take an awful lot uh, <coughs> out of you mentally and they're not really profitable. An awful, the, the, you're better off doing CO2 tables and very intense CO2 tables at that. I'm going to... Uh, talk next week about uh, if there are, uh, we'll of course address any questions that come in um, but next week one of the things I'm going to talk about is a, a subject that is very important to understand uh, for training and uh, that's going to be um, the subject of nitric oxide what it is, what it is for the freediver, how it helps the freediver enormously and how important it is for the freediver, <coughs> what he can do to replenish and also to increase his nitric oxide levels. It's a kind of super gas and one thing I do not mean are the supposed um, supplements that they advertise in the bodybuilding magazines that are supposed to up your nitric oxide. They don't. They do not work. Dig that. Uh, the only thing that they've got in them that is even vaguely in the chain 
uh, which until recent experiments was thought to be the only thing you could do to up your nitric oxide levels, was take a substance called L-arginine. Um, L-arginine, uh, people have taken it and there's no proven results for it. It is in the chain, the body does produce it, but hey, uh, it's not a proven uh, remedy for this. The next webinar in English will be on March the 13th and it'll be at the GMT plus 2, uh, 2100 hours, GMT plus 2. Uh, that's his ready time. And uh, I hope very much to see you all then. And I hope you've got some questions for me because we're going to thrive on your questions. It's silly you're hearing either repeats or hearing uh, things that uh, don't interest you when there may be things that really do interest you out there. Um, so, uh, again, questions. There are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. If you don't want your name re mentioned, Please just say, don't say my name. And we will respect that. Uh, you can also email me uh, at aron, spelled A-H-A-R-O-N, at freedivers.net. Or you can send it to uh, info at freedivers.net. Uh, we also have a website www.freedivers.net uh, so uh, either way do get in touch with me do let me have your questions and I'll be very happy to, to see you all next week so have a very successful week in the meantime um, and that's uh, that's it. The sea here is very calm at the moment, except for today. It was a little bit rough today because we had a southerly last night. Water temperatures are up in the range of 21.6. And uh, visibility has, until today, been fantastic. We've been having, you can see the bottom very clearly at uh, 30 meters from the surface. So uh, anyway, enjoy your diving. Uh, dive safely, and I hope to see you all again next week. Bye.